Ryan Dahl here, back with another great episode of Praise Charts Live. Today's going to be kind of unique because I'm not talking to a songwriter per se or a worship leader. I'm talking to a professor, and we are going to go a little deeper into this whole world of choral music and just talk about what is actually happening in the world of choir, choir music these days in our modern era. Are choirs disappearing? Is there a reason... Um, you know, sociological as well as biblical for choirs to stay strong in the church. We're going to talk about that with Dr. Will Whitaker. Just before we go into that, I want to show you this because this is kind of where this got inspired with. Oh, there's Will right now. I'll introduce him in a sec. But that article was uh, that he wrote called A Case for the Church Choir, Where Have All the Churches Gone? So we read this article and we were like, we need to talk to this guy. Let's have a conversation. So he's with me right now, Dr. Will Whitaker. Here we go with Praise Charts Live. Hello, Dr. Whitaker. Hello. <laughs> Good to talk to you. Uh, I had never Good actually to gone here. to my uh, you know, laptop view before, and I was introducing you, and I was like, oh, there he is, Dr. Whitaker. A little preview of what he looks like. So... Uh, Thanks so much. Are you like calling in from your university office? You know, is this like well, in between I'm, sessions? I'm, <laughs> well, I'm actually um, at the church today, so you I are. serve a church in the Atlanta area. So I'm here today. Uh, yes. So uh, that's where I'm calling from today. You know, maybe I got that wrong. Let's clarify that right now, because I introduced you as a professor, but maybe it's true that you are a worship pastor yourself I, I, is that I right i am i am i am a worship pastor okay. and so i do some teaching for one of our georgia baptist schools okay uh, and so that that's it's very fulfilling but it, i'm really full-time worship pastor is right on. really what i do full-time so more more that direction <laughs> than the other direction so all right all right but i think you know it goes without saying that you have dedicated yourself to some significant study in your life looking at this whole world of music and worship and sort of the biblical foundations for it. Uh, you have a doctor of musical arts in church music. That's what I read. And then uh, a master's in, uh, help me out here. What's your master's degree in? Music, what? music ed. So my bachelor's okay. and master's degrees are both uh, music ed. So I was, a choir, I was a high school choir director before I went yeah. into full-time ministry. So Yeah, I love it. Well, I was thinking, you know, you and me are like two peas in a pod here. I feel like we're a good, right. uh, you know, together because uh, I've I've done a lot of education myself. I have a religious studies degree and studied education and all of that. But then I got into this world of praise charts. And I have to admit, when I dove into praise charts, I barely knew what I was doing. But I loved music. I loved the church. I loved gathering people together, singing. I was a worship pastor myself, just like you, trying to form choirs, had orchestras. And so my whole desire in all that I do in, in Praise Charts is really kind of comes back to having resources that ultimately help build community in churches. That's kind of, you know, something that really inspires me. How about you? Like, what's your core passion, your core inspiration, or your core sense of you know, calling about this whole world of music. What would you say it is for you? I think I think because of my education background uh, yeah. and my uh, my experiences teaching high school choir, middle school, high school choir, I, I sort of see the fact that you have to capture uh, musicians at an early age and get them involved in uh, church uh, service. Uh, so yeah. we do that here as we have uh, kids and students and they're yeah. involved in their own things. So we have, you know, graded children's choirs, we have a student choir, but we also allow our students and our children that are able to, especially our students yeah. that are able to participate. Maybe they play an instrument, they can be a part of an orchestra or, or yeah. we even have some uh, students that sing in with our, our adult choir, kind of a intergenerational approach really there. So yeah. for me, I hate to say that I take an education kind of standpoint to ministry, but I really yeah. feel that that's my uh, role is to invest in, in young people will invest in, in all ages, really, but getting yeah. them, uh, finding, helping them find a place of service so that they can do that for life. So they'll want to find a place yeah. even when they go to college and afterwards, a yeah. church to get plugged into where they can serve. Yeah. I have a very life-shaping memory uh, myself because when I, I was a, 
mid 20s year old i was you know early worship pastor and had this little orchestra and i can remember after a service one sunday when i had a couple of saxophone and trumpet players these are young people grade 10 grade 11 but after the service you know their mom came up to me and they she was just like thank you so much for making a space for my my son here on this team and then just actually this last Sunday, I went back to the church where I started Praise Charts out of the ministry I was a part of there, and lo and behold, saw one of the girls who was my trombone player when she was grade 10, and now she's like 35 years old, just having a baby, and it was like just a blast from the past where you look at the impact you had on someone and now see them, you know, carrying on, and uh, so it's so much more than just about playing great songs and great chord progressions and having multi-tracks that make a sound like, you know, the awesome album. It's like there's a whole sociological, interpersonal ministry that this is connected with, right? Which, uh, which makes your Absolutely focus great. on the educational side so, so important to thoughtfully look at what is it that we're doing? What's happening in the church? Where are we maybe losing ground? Where do we need to, like, teach people and bring people back, you know, into a, a, a line that has long-term positive effects on us. So that's kind of what we want Absolutely. to talk about here today. So, uh, so many questions that I have. Um, I'm just going to kind of like dive right in. I think one of the first things I, I just wanted to ask is, is like, is the choir fading away in churches in general? What's your sense of like, what is the data that you have seen? Do you see that choirs are slipping away? Have they become uncool? Um, tell me, what, you, what what do you see when you look at the landscape of different churches? <laughs> well, what I see and what the research really says is that the yeah. white evangelical church, they are declining at a much okay. faster rate than, say, our mainline Protestant or Catholic uh, uh, religions, uh, even uh, even in our in our black Protestant churches, they are thriving. In fact, still to this day, it looks hmm. like seventy five percent of black Protestant churches have some sort of choir. And mm-hmm. so, to say that they're irrelevant or say that they can't be used in in any scenario is really just a fallacy. I really mm-hmm. see that um, we have some places and we see the white evangelical church, of course, I'm a part of that. So I think that's why it's near and dear to me because I keep having conversations with colleagues, with people who whose uh, pastors or leadership decide that it's too hard, it's too expensive, it's too whatever, a hundred different yeah. reasons why uh, they, they see it kind of moving away. And I, I, I believe that there's just not really a better way to get people of varying talents uh, together to be able to, to worship the Lord. When you relegate it just to a few, it, yeah. it loses its ability to reach a, a wider a wider group of people. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a shame because if you take away that ability for them to grow into that, if you don't have uh, children's choirs or children's music activities or student activities, you really are not resourcing the adults of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's, it's very important that we look at the fact that for some reason, the white evangelical church has bought into this uh, uh, philosophy, really, that only band-driven worship is the only way that people are going to see, uh, that's, excuse me, that's only attractive to to people yeah. who are either de-churched or not a part of church. And yeah. uh, while some of that is true, we do see that popular culture and pop music really is band-driven. Uh, we're missing the biblical side of that, which yeah. is is the fact that doesn't say that only a few have the ability to be a part or only a few uh, skilled people have uh, the opportunity to, to serve the Lord. So yeah. I think that we've got to figure out a way to to bring that together. And the choir is the perfect, perfect way to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Orchestras are the perfect way to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some churches are too small to be able to have either one. And so I'm not pointing fingers and say, if you don't have a choir, you know, you're, you're wrong. Or if you only mm-hmm. have a praise team, I, I think that you have to look at your context and you have to look at your church and you have to say, okay, this is what the Lord has brought to us. This is what we can do well. This mm-hmm. is how we can 
can mirror what we understand biblical unity to be and uh, corporate worship to be. And we're going to do that well and trying yeah. to find ways that people of all ages, people of all abilities to be able to find a way to to serve and to uh, yeah. be a part of the Lord, because we certainly don't throw out um, people who don't understand the Bible and people, you know, the, the people who've studied the Bible for 100 years and are Sunday school teachers are not the only ones to deserve to be able to read the Bible. So we no. we need to say that in music ministry, it's the same the same kind of concept that we've got to be able mm. to be uh, to uh, to find a way to bring alongside the the less skilled that will call them that the less skilled yeah. uh, alongside the, those that are skilled. I wonder. I wonder what it is culturally that is going on. Like, I mean, we can speak candidly. Here we are, two white guys, um, you know, talking about, and it's like, I, I love, of course, all people of all colors and lots of intergenerational churches. But the reality is there's lots of churches that are predominantly white. There's lots of churches that are mixed racially and some churches that are black. We have different cultures. There's I live up in what would be called the Northwest, which is really the Southwest of Canada. But, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of choirs around where I live right now. I'm probably in that kind of northwest. There's a culture up here in the northwest of, of uh, America, whereas there's a culture in the southeast that is uh, is different. So so what do you think? Let, let's just talk about right. some and of the cultural phenomenons of different right. perhaps colors. But it's not just color. It's also where... Where you live in America, there's different sociological things going on that, you right. know, and can we talk about this without being right. offensive there are. to people? <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Because um, that's, you know, before I say it, I can be very candid and say that there's there's absolutely, uh, there are absolutely differences. And to say that they're not and that we're all homogenous would be yeah. a lie. Right. And so we have to recognize that from the beginning. You look at the Midwest, you look at Minnesota and the rich choral traditions that, that come from St. Olaf and some of these other places and conversations that I've had with people over the years is they have plenty of choirs in, in yeah. parts of the Midwest where they're thriving. Um, and you... It, 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 it really just kind of depends on your on your scenario, uh, really where you are. And then, of course, the Northwest is, is very different. It, it is a cultural thing. Um, mm. I, I think that that has really kind of really been something that has that has changed uh, through, throughout time, because, mm -hmm. um, say, several decades ago, I, there was there were a lot more choirs and it was just kind of a, a norm that you just had more of that that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I see that. Um, I think that I'm not seeing so much some ways in some places. I'm not seeing school choirs, which is why I wrote the article in the first place was right. I know that, that school choirs are continuing to thrive and they have found a way to be able to put the really overly um, strong, uh, musical, rich, traditional music along with some newer things. And so they're trying to find that, uh, that uh, balance between being able to yeah. be a little bit culturally relevant, even within there. And um, even in my area, um, you know, choral music is, is really, really, really thriving. And I have a couple of choral directors that are in my choir, and I talk to them about the hundreds of kids that are in their choral program. And uh, everybody else uh, in my tradition, in our evangelical tradition, in our area, saying we just can't even have a student choir, and I'm like, why? What's mm -hmm. what's the problem here? And you know, in, in a hundred different uh, uh, excuses come up. Oh, well, we're so busy here, we can't do this, mm -hmm. or we don't have Sunday nights anymore, and we used to have mm -hmm. Sunday nights, and Sunday nights was the time for the choir. So you can think of a hundred different different reasons. But uh, let's take, for instance, going back to your actual question, because I feel like I went <laughs> off on a tangent. Going back to your actual question we were talking about like black protestant churches it's just part of their culture that whole call and response kind of thing you right. know you have a soloist whatever you're singing and there's the backup and and so that kind of thing is very very popular in in uh, the black church and they have managed to keep that very energetic and managed to keep it very uh, alive and yeah. uh, i think that's one of the main things that we have not necessarily been able to do very well in the white evangelical church is create a exciting experience even from the choir it's either been really 
will sound very choral, which unless you're a music nerd like me, you know, yeah. you're not necessarily going to respond to that. And so yeah. we've had this push of emotionalism that mm -hmm. has pushed in over the last, you know, starting back even before, but really since the since the Jesus movement and yeah. um, the, 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 the vineyard movement, especially um, coming, you know, out of Calvary Chapel. And then, of course, definitely the it was John Wimber and the uh, uh, vineyard movement as it moved. And we wanted to have that experience. It was very personal and, and all of that kind of thing. And so worship became very personal. And so to have a very traditional type choir became very stilted uh -huh. and uh, traditional. And it wasn't uh it didn't wasn't received very well, but the black church has figured out how to keep that energy going. Right. So I am very excited that I am starting to see as we look at things that praise charts is putting out for choirs right. or even, you know, you're even, even over the years and we've been praise chart fans. I've been <laughs> a praise chart fan for at least a decade or more. Yeah. Um, I just, I like your stuff um, and our people like your stuff, but being able to, to, to retool those for choral things or whatever, keeping the energy high the orchestrations or, good things that that come off very energetic and passionate yeah. um and th those are important so we're not negating the fact that the text has to be strong that has to be doctrinally rich and all those types of things but if you can find something that's going to also get to that heart heart yeah. part and uh, that emotional part then we're going to really kind of see that going yeah i definitely um, think i was going to say this is what what we're doing as praise charts probably is trying to, um, you know, harken back to some of the mu music of the uh, Jesus movement, which you might call emotionalistic or, or whatever. I mean, I personally just think music is emotional by the very nature of it. You know, it's just there's nothing wrong with emotion in music, but it, it just needs to be harnessed and, you know, and led appropriately. But we yeah. we want to create resources so that we right. can still have the rich experience of a choir and feel like we're able to sing songs and even playing in our orchestra. We're trying to write this latest uh, signature sessions, orchestrations in a, in a more modern kind of symphonic way so that right. people feel like, hey, we're in 2020, you know, and, and some people want to experience music like it, it feels like we're a part of our, our culture. So, and, yeah. and, what you, and what you cannot disregard and what I'm really excited that I'm seeing among mm -hmm. even our writers is, um, and not all of, you know, not all of them are doing as great a job, but we're starting to see songs that are worth singing. They're not right. re overly repetitive. They're, right. they're either straight scripture or scriptural illusion, or they're, yeah. they're very strong doctrinally. And those are the things that even the most traditional people cannot negate as they're looking at a song. Okay. Well, maybe that's not, you know, you know, overly musically perfect, you know, the harmony is not too rich or whatever the traditionalists are, are, yeah. are saying is, oh, that's too simple. But what we're saying is we really want to put on the lips of our people doctrinally rich songs, biblically rich songs yeah. that have something that we can do well, because regardless of what whatever uh, your church scenario is, no one wants to hear something that doesn't sound good. And so yeah. you've got to find things that are workable for your people. Um, and the average church choir is not going to be able to handle really, really uh, sophisticated choral music. Yeah. Um, you know, very, very few of them can really do that. And if you can, wonderful. If your, your mm -hmm. culture says that's great, if your church context is, is such that, you know, that ri a rich choral tradition is fine. But for the average church choir, you know, most of your men are not going to be music readers. And so you're going to have to teach yeah. a lot by rote. And and you you want to make that experience of even the choir rehearsal, a worshipful work kind of situation. Yeah. And so for them to have to sit there and, you know, go like this, you know, mm -hmm. okay, 20 minutes working with sopranos, you know, that's just not going <laughs> to work no. for them so you, no. you want it to be something that they can feel engaged in they feel like they're being a part that they're serving that kind of thing so yeah. um one of the things that i've noticed is i've gone out of the country and other places um especially even in hispanic uh, cultures they they value a rich tradition of of rhythm and um it's there's uh, you know think of uh, the times i've been twice to, sure. to Cuba and to think of some of the some of the the habanero rhythms or some of the other types of things that are just naturally infused into their worship um, one of the things that I've noticed in, in mo most churches that are not necessarily in uh, America maybe maybe not in Canada or whatever is most of them are not 
Uh, most of their churches do not have multiple types of services. So they may have a church a service that's contemporary or service that's traditional. They, they, they really value being together. And so they don't say, well, we can't do that song. We can't do that song. And so they split. They are very intergenerational in their approach, which um, at, when I did my research for my doctorate, I really focused on the intergenerational church, actually the choir in the intergenerational church, which is yeah. why I try to combine them as most, much as possible. And so if I had to wave my flag of what I was about, I would say I'm hmm. all about the church of all ages being able to be a part. And I believe that the choir yeah. is an excellent way, not the only way, but an no. excellent way to achieve that. Yeah, beautiful. Let's uh, let's go deep. I want to go into to two areas. One, just explore a bit of the biblical foundations for the choir. Maybe you could just walk us through a bit of the history. Take us back a couple thousand years and how that even relates to what sure. we're doing today. And then just talking about kind of sociological and even, you know, psychological or interpersonal. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is not the non-biblical, but, you know, like the humanitarian benefits of being in a choir? What happens to a person's psyche when they're surrounded by other people and just that kind of stuff? I know there's some rich studies that have been done, and and this is part of the value of having you here. You've looked at some of this. So I just want to try to cover the the round right. spectrum of the benefits of the choir. Well, let's just start biblically just for a couple of minutes, just right. to give us a bit of that foundation of, does anything that happened a couple thousand years ago relates to what we're trying to experience today. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, not to, I'm not going to, I, I, I'm literally not going to outline every single scripture that talks a lot no. about it, but you know, um, the Lord gave David the idea of the choir in first Chronicles 15, 16, when he appoints a choir of the Levites uh, to, to be a part of, of, of leading in worship uh, that time. And so it's very, very expressly mm -hmm. put in there. And then later, even in um, the 25th chapter of first Chronicles, you know, they're appointed 288 skillful musicians to be a part of, of, of instrumental ministry, the choral ministry. And we see that we even see in Nehemiah when the rebuilding of the wall was happening in Nehemiah 12, that they had two different choirs, you know, and they were going across the they were going across the periphery of the of the uh, of the new wall that was uh, was being built, and uh, they led the charge of giving praise. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we see that throughout Scripture that the choir, that musicians were were led in leading the people, leading the Israelites in uh, worship of the Lord. And yeah. so we see this biblical. Kind of thing. Now, one of the things that we don't see is we don't see the word choir ever appear in the New Testament. But what right. we do see in the New say. Testament, yeah. it, we we do not in that express that expressly kind of put. But what we see throughout the New Testament is this call to unity, this right. call to uh, being a part of the body of Christ. We see in First uh, Corinthians twelve the whole bit about uh, being one body but many parts, and you know I I, I kind of liken that to okay, so I've got several people in my choir right now that have master's degrees in music. They're music educators, or they've done other things, or retired from music education. They have um, they are very skilled in what they do. But then I have people that literally have some trouble even finding their part on the page and i'm not trying to make fun of them they would no. laugh too but yeah. they love making a joyful noise have nice voices <laughs> but they're not really necessarily going to fall on but every single one of them is a part of the body of christ and yeah. first corinthians 12 reminds us that um you can't say that the eye is more important than than the mouth or, or whatever and so we're all a part of this and so we see that throughout scripture philippians 2 we hear a lot about not looking to your own interests but to those of others but so not being selfish and just the whole idea of unity in john 17 we have the the high priestly prayer where we're reminded over and over again that we need to be in unity being one yeah. together and even in acts 2 when we look at that sometimes as a model for worship when we looked at they devoted themselves to the teaching and preaching and the, all of the other types of stuff. They were unified. The church was unified and they were together. And so I believe that the choir is a perfect community. I believe that the word community, right in the middle of the word community, is the word unity, which is yeah. no surprise to, to anyone. And so the choir is a very unique community of faith because everybody in there shares a particular passion. So anytime yeah. you find a bunch of people that enjoy music together or being a part of that, they have uh, already something in common. 
they have that emotional connection because uh, like for instance last night we were singing a song and it was just it just i just could feel the presence of god just kind of working on the people as they're singing and we just you know you can just stop and just have a moment and just hmm have a moment of, of worship and reminding us of what the text said and how it made us feel and the fact that we're getting to lead this together. And so we're all unified in this purpose of being able to be called as worship leaders together. Hmm. So we're of varying ages, varying abilities. Sometimes we may not like always the song that we're singing right at that moment, but maybe that's someone's favorite song, but maybe the next song is your favorite song. And so we've learned to, uh, yeah. to have to, yield ourselves to, to, to other people as we do that. And sociologically, there's just so much about having to put your own preferences aside sometimes for, for other people. And so there's something very spiritually rewarding about saying, you know, I don't like that song, but I love you. I've yeah. developed a relationship with you. I love you. And you love that song. That's your heart language. That Gaither song that we did that, you know, yeah. that 20 year old's like, what is this song uh, is the heart language of somebody because that was a song that was played when they went to that Billy Graham revival and they gave their heart to Jesus. You know, yeah. you just, you just never know. And so people can learn each other, the opportunity for people to develop relationships in the choir, no matter how big your choir is. And I could go on and on about ways to foster relationships in your choir. Uh, that's not necessarily what you're asking, but those yeah. are those are vital because it is a kind of a microcosm of the community of faith in which you uh, have your choir. And yeah. so it's 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 great. There's something about singing that's good for your breathing and good for your um, for your psyche. Uh, the, the benefits are, are, are there. It's it's good for you. And it's definitely uh, something about being a part of, of something and kind of you know, working toward a goal, working toward yeah. a goal as community faith is very important. In the article that you wrote, you made reference to this. It was like a, a whole impact study. I think from my perception of it, and I'll just kind of show it here, we can kind of flip through it a bit, but this wasn't necessarily just a church-based thing, right? This is Chorus oh, America. It wasn't but, at all. <laughs> no, but yeah. this is like a very technical study. I'm just kind of flipping through some of it, and maybe you can comment a bit. I know you've... Uh, kind of really taken some time to pour through it, but looking at some key impact, positive impacts of being in a choir and just sort of systematically was going through the findings. These are data research findings about the positive impacts of people in choirs. So um, just maybe as I'm flipping through it, you can comment on a couple of things that you picked up or were impacted by as you wrote your article. Well, uh, well, of course, I, I mentioned a lot of the statistics yeah. at the beginning that really talk about the fact that, hey, if there's, um, I can't remember exactly what the number was for students, uh, but it was like 11 million students or 17. I really probably should have memorized that part, but yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> the, the millions and millions of students that were involved in adults. Okay, so we have 300, we'll just say in America, we have 300 million people or so or whatever, but uh, to, okay, it's 11 million, there it is. <laughs> uh, so to see uh, that so many people are participating in community choirs and then to kind of match that with another study that I was looking at, a congregational study that mm -hmm. was looking at church uh, church communities of faith and thinking there's a disconnect here i'm hmm. i'm seeing positive things in this chorus america article our research study and all i'm seeing from the white evangelical church which is of course was my main point of interest just because of, of you know where where i am in in my own uh, context um i wanted to and, and I hope I did. I wanted to encourage those that were doing them to keep carrying that banner and that we needed to keep doing that um, because it's it's so important to 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 do that. Uh, but uh, it was it it's it seems that COVID did a thing that mm -hmm. was not so great um, for a lot of church choirs. Um, it, it really um gave some leadership and i don't want to point necessarily fingers um, at particular parts of church leadership but i'll just say leaders in general it gave leaders some opportunities to say you know what this was this was too much we can't do it and there was an awful lot of research that was um, brought out 
um, the, the studies that the music educators wanted to have done so that they could um, justify when they would be able to have rehearsals again because they wanted to see what the air saw, transmissions, all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of church people who read it thought, well, we can't have a choir for now. And so all of a sudden they were like, we're going to get rid of it. Yeah. And so the timeliness of my be- my article kind of trying to come out at that same time was just saying, OK, let's remember why we should have a choir in the first place. Yeah. Let's not look at how cool it is or how bad it is, but that it is an awesome way to be able to uh, involve uh, multiple people of multiple skills. Because if you just get five or six people up on the platform and get them leading, no matter how great they are, great they are. Um, then when those people decide to leave, who's going to replace them? Yeah. I mean, you you have no systematic approach for, for developing new leaders. Um, and I'm going to give one little plug. It's not out yet, but I'm actually in the middle of writing a book um, mm-hmm. on intergenerational worship. It's call, going to be called, I, unless it changes, which I don't think it is, Cultivating Intergenerational Worship, Helping Leaders uh, uh, Design and Develop uh, uh, worship, Corporate Worship for All Ages. And so this uh, one of the chapters in the book is basically this article that I wrote, but where I talk a lot about how um, the, uh, churches can find ways to develop all ages, but one of the other chapters I have is I use um, a developmental model that actually came from educators. Um, it's called the gradual release model of responsibility. It was developed for teaching reading, but I think it's a wonderful model for allowing uh, church leaders to be able to uh, find a systematic approach for developing an emerging leader and getting them to uh, the, where they could lead. And that, that could be somebody who's on the platform, a pianist, a, a player, a uh, 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 acquirement, any any type of thing, a worship leader, uh, whatever you want to do. We used it uh, most recently developing a student accompanist uh, for one of our groups. And so it was it was very beneficial, very helpful. And uh, I think that that's what we got to do. We got to invest in new leaders. Yep. Be intentional about it. Well, I think yeah. I want to say that what we're seeing in Praise Charts is definitely an upswing in uh, choral music and so and that's partly why we have decided hey we're going to invest into this and we're pouring out a lot of energy into trying to make resources so that people can uh, in the context of the praise charts you know praise and worship world we're merging the modern worship with the you know the classic uh, grouping of a choir we're wanting to see that kind of merge together so we don't have as many of the classical kind of choir type music but Again, it's, it's okay. for us. I like what you were saying about when it came to the New Testament, there wasn't so much really talking about is it a choir or is it a team or what is it? It's like it's got to be about unity, and that's the most important thing. So that's what prevails in the New Testament, and it's how we express that. So, yeah. so let's for uh, me just, to yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say for me to say that the choir or an orchestra or these these are seen as sort of traditional types of worship elements. Yeah. We use them. But part yeah. of that is because our context is so we have that that infrastructure there. But if it wasn't there, we would figure out what our culture, what our context yep. uh, could handle and what we could do to the best of our ability. And that's really what every church has to decide. So for me yeah. to say that there's only one way would be completely false. I, no. I'm an advocate for people leading in worship that feel called to it and mm-hmm. finding the best way to do that is, is your, is your job. The most, the best way you can find uh, to include the most people mm-hmm. that, that that's really, that's the biblical thing is to find mm-hmm. that unified way. And uh, because there's different parts of the body, you know, some may be a little less skilled and mm-hmm. uh, we shouldn't just kind of push them to the side. We need to try to figure yeah. out ways to bring them along. The reality, though, is if I'm a worship te- pastor or if I'm a part-time worship leader, it sounds a lot easier to call up four oh, yeah. people and have them play on Sunday than to manage 50 people or 100, you know, or something like that. So there's just like the, And maybe we could talk a little bit about that. So, okay, so you've sold me on the idea. I want to have a choir, but it just the idea of it seems daunting. How do yeah. I recruit members into this group? How do I keep them there? Keep them interested? Where do I put them? How do I organize all the music? There's going to be a thousand papers going 17 different directions. Let's just talk about some of the logistics and maybe take down some of the 
the right. scare of can right. I actually do this? <laughs> well, um, it has to be done little by little. You cannot reinvent the wheel. I mean, not reinvent the wheel. You cannot um, build Rome in a day. That I used the wrong euphemism there. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is you have to figure out, okay, who's who's already interested? So I think that it's, it's pretty easy to say, okay, we're going to develop a music team. Call it something that's maybe not so scary like a choir or whatever, yeah. but we... Uh, some people, the nomenclature really bothers them. You, you just, you know, whatever. We need some singers. We need some mm -hmm. singers um, that are maybe not going to be on their own mic. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to use them in, in a way, um, finding a way to value them. Some people have seen these, what they will call backup choirs or whatever that, um, where they're literally not doing anything, but just standing there, just kind of looking like a worship looking leader. Yeah. So, and, and, and there is there is definitely a time and a place maybe for that, but you want to make sure that, that they feel valued. So how can they feel valued? How can you make sure that okay they're going to be a part of the music mix or whatever? So mm -hmm. um, start small, figure out who's there. Uh, the best way to recruit people is to get the people that are already a part of your planning team. Which I'll back up and say, if you're going to do anything new, you need to get some people that can partner with you uh, to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, and to seek the Lord's guidance on what to do. And with those people, try to maybe get some names of some churches, some people in your church um, that, you know, maybe have some musical skill. And then you need to contact them personally. I mean, everyone loves the personal contact. And yes, it's going to take time. Yeah. And to go back to your point about, hey, I'm a part-time worship leader, and it's so much easier for me to just put four people on the platform. I would push back at them and say, your role mm -hmm. is to lead worship. But what you are really called to do, what you are really called to do, invest in in other people. You are a pastor first. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you do, you are a pastor, and so yeah. it is important that you never forget that people are your your goal. Yeah. Now your pastor yeah. may be saying, "Hey, I've got I've got to get um, I've got to get uh, this quality up every week or whatever, but you're going to have to remind your pastor that the role is to uh, really get the right people there uh, and to in invest in them. Because if not, then you're going to just be spinning your wheels, working from mm -hmm. week to week, trying to get the best four songs done. And you're yeah. never going to develop anything over time. So yeah. I was going to say, say all of that. Personal contacts, very important. Um, finding the right people to communicate, uh, trying to contact them personally, tell them to give it a try. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can find, um, so we use Planning Center online, and I'm not getting a kickback from them by nope. saying this, but yep. any anything you can do to make your life easier, and I'll tell you, yep. Planning Center transformed our lives years ago <laughs> when we moved to that, to be able to bring all that kind of stuff. And as I will, I will plug a phrase chart thing is if you get something from place charts, it would go directly yep. into uh, your planning center stuff. And uh, you can pick which keys, you know, the great thing with place charts is they've got usually two or three, sometimes four or more keys that mm -hmm. you can uh, pitch your stuff in. And I appreciate, and I'll just say this to you since you're the owner, I appreciate that you pitch things in singable keys yeah, um, for I'm the congregation. That. It's free. Yeah. That's that's good. So you may have the original key in there or whatever, but you know, for your normal singer, they're not going to be able to sing a fourth higher than probably some of the keys. Yeah. But it's we're 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 very thankful for that. Um, and I know that others are too. Yeah. So finding ways to bring um, under control the administrative stuff. If you're not good at administrative, a lot of creative worship pastors uh, love the music part, but hate the administrative stuff. If you don't have someone who can help you at your church, um, like a paid person, like a, a admin or whatever, then um, find somebody in your ministry that can really help you with that. Uh, if you are going to do paper copies of stuff or whatever, where would you store it? Those kinds of things. Find people to do things that you either don't have time to do uh, or can't do. A friend of mine told me one time, he said, Will, you should never do anything that somebody else can do for you in ministry. Hmm. And that stuck with me so much because he said you would be a very overpaid administrative assistant yep. if you spent all day copying parts and getting things ready and for people want to help right 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. They want to help. And it's yeah. going to take some time to get them up to speed or whatever. But remember, a little bit of effort on the front end is really going to pay dividends down the road. So I'm mm-hmm. um, finding those ways to do that. Once you get them in there, make sure they feel valued. How can you make mm-hmm. them feel valued? Make sure they have the opportunity. Make sure that you constantly put the vision of what your music ministry is about and what your church is about. Make them say, hey, you are a matter. Each one of you matters. Yeah. Each one of you brings a different tone, color, or whatever musical term you want to use to yeah. the mix. And we need you all. And we need uh, that to be a part of what uh, makes who we are. Uh, yeah. Give them give them things to give them ways to, to be involved. Find ways to keep the uh, find a fellowship time. So you do, uh, there's, there's hundreds of ways to keep them involved and keep them excited, right. but they're, they, they're going to get attached because they're interested in music. And so the music needs to be sort of the centerpiece of what you do. Give them songs that are going to challenge them a little bit, but not yeah. be so challenging that they are suffering all the time. So find yeah. that balance, find things that are good, find things that are that are strong uh, doctrinally and textually, make sure that they're good, uh, feature them as much as possible. I am very much in favor of uh, the choir special or the choir anthem okay. or yeah. whatever term you want to be used, being used. Now, maybe your context is not where you would be able to do that every week. We do that every week, but we're like I said, we're probably still a little bit of an anomaly in the evangelical church. We're one yeah. of those thirty something percent that are still <laughs> yeah. uh, blowing and going that kind of thing. But uh, find ways to feature them to to allow them to lead out. Um, remind them of their role as worship leaders, worship modelers, and so. Uh, make sure that you keep it as far away from that performance kind of mentality as you possibly can, but allow them to be able to be a part of of, uh, of being able to present music. Because the proclamation ministry is, is also very, very uh, biblical, that being able to yeah. uh, share a testimony through yeah. song, so to speak. Um, yeah. So that that's really important. Really good. So that could Maybe help. just, uh, that's, re- that's really great. Just kind of as we're, we're wrapping up, but uh, this one uh, kind of divide between a, a choir as a performance base, you were saying, well, we don't want to have them, you know, performing, but there is that performance element, and then there is like the worship leading, you know, with the congregation. That's certainly something that we're trying to promote for through what yeah. the music that we're providing in praise charts is to say, see your choir as like a worship leading choir, not just a tag on to the congregational worship, but actually engaged and prepared in that. But And then there is of, often, uh, whether it's an offertory special or at some point where the choir is featured. And maybe that's not all bad. Sometimes I talk about that no, it's myself. Not. Like, oh, that's, you know, that's the old way. But um, it can be very special to invest time into presenting something um, so let's just talk about those two roles of right. the choir. Well, the whole idea of it being performance oriented, I, I do want to say that I I think that uh, it can also be argued, not that we're going to argue about it, but it mm-hmm. also could be argued that a five or six piece band is performing mm-hmm. and the congregation, if they don't know the song or if you're putting so much new music in front of them, has no idea, then basically all that they're doing is just just listening or they're yeah. barely able to participate. So yeah. the argument could be that any type of musical group could be performance oriented. It's the heart behind it. It's right. the way in which the leadership finds ways to engage the congregation. If it's going to be that way, I, I've seen several churches that have choirs where they the, the spirit of the congregation being able to even be a part to sing along is is part of that, even in this proclamation kind of thing. I think that throughout the years, we've seen that there are certain songs, certain songs that are just too difficult to try to teach. Uh, more more technical, like the rhythms are really tricky or whatever yeah. or whatever. So there's certain songs that the congregation just it's just not suited for the unskilled singer to sing. So for the choir to be able to do that, for them to be able to share that, for them to be able to, uh, for instance, 
uh, have the testimony part, especially if the song is about this is what God has done in my life. So mm -hmm. you're basically the person in a congregation is sitting there hearing that as a testimony. We have people get up and give testimony all the time vocally, you mm -hmm. know, t t uh, speaking it or whatever. It's the same kind of scenario. So it's not so much about about entertainment. It's more about the heart behind it and what it's about. And so striking that balance is, is, is fine. And if the choir understands that they're doing something that um, is not the congregation can't do necessarily, then that's sort of what they're, they're, they're doing. And in my scenario, my choir loves the fact that they get to be able to do that, that they yeah. get to be a part of a ministry where they, they have a, a voice um, and then also get to lead. It's a both and for them. Yeah, for sure. So great. Well, such rich conversation. And thank you for, you know, just being proactive with this and uh, and helping, you know, push us deeper, certainly with your the article that you wrote and then the, now the book that you're writing. It, it sounds great. I think we should book you for another conversation just about intergenerational yeah. worship. Once the yeah. book comes out, we could help you um, get the word out about that. I know that, uh, and even in choral music, one of the things we're going to try to do, we're going to try to introduce some arrangements that are specifically intergenerationally arranged. Like there's ways to arrange music that you could have a children's choir or, or a youth oh, yeah. choir mixed in and have some intentional kind of, you know, balance between those. So, uh, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us, so much music to arrange and, and make in order to support this whole vision. So, uh, so let's that's, stay connected. Oh, that's, it's super great. Yes, All right. Sir. Right on. Well, Dr. Will Whitaker, thank you so much for taking the time with us. It's been a very good, rich, full hour, lots of conversation. I hope that if you're listening in and, uh, you have a choir that you're encouraged and feeling like you're on the right track. It's worth the time and energy to pour into that. And if you're, you know, on the fence and wondering, should I invest in this? I just want to encourage you to, to consider that and maybe use some of the modern resources we have, like certainly with praise charts, we have easy access to some great resources. Um, this latest session that we're just putting out is called the signature sessions, and we're doing them in four different vocal style. So there's like the choral anthem, which is going to be the bigger church, bigger orchestra thing. Then there is worship choir, which is like a three-part, much easier, put into keys that are accessible. Uh, a two-part unison, which is, man, in one practice, you could pull off those songs and still have some good, rich harmonies. And then we also have this kind of sing it now um, version, which is still four part, but um, in a good key and very accessible. So we're just trying to make it so that all choirs of all kinds and different musical expertise can engage with some of these same songs. So, uh, and it's kind of interesting that. to see just in the, we just launched Signature Sessions just early last week and seeing that like the worship choir version, for example, one one church just went and bought, you know, the song and they just wanted the three part harmony version with the full orchestra and they bought 70 copies for their choir. It's like, wow, it's it's actually happening. Like this was the dream and it's happening. So I'm excited. We're going to continue pouring into it. I've just recently, you know, we've brought in new arrangers, new orchestrators, producers. We've brought those into the team in praise charts and uh Going to be pumping out lots of lots of music in the in the coming months. So, yeah, we're together with you on this, uh, Will, and uh, appreciate your your heart. So, thank you very much. We're going to put links to the article to that PDF if you're interested in going a little deeper into the technical study that was done about choral music. Uh, Will has a blog that he writes and um, other links like that, plus links to our signature sessions and other um, series of. Choral music at praise charts, choral anthems, worship choir, two-part unison, and sing it now, and lots of other music. So there is more than enough. If you want to take a step forward with this, lots of things that you can do out of this time. So thank you very much, and uh, Will, have yourself a great day. Thank you for pouring your time you. into us at praise charts today. God bless you all. We'll thank see you. you. Okay, bye then.